Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see some of you all again here. Uh, so I'm Command Sergeant Major John Wayne Troxel, the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dunford. I also serve as the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Secretary of Defense. Um, thank you all for being here today. We really appreciate this dialogue we're going to have between our combatant command senior enlisted leaders who uh, are in the operational environment every day getting after the mission. Uh, this is all part of my annual Defense Senior Enlisted Leader Council meetings. And it's a council that is drive, driven by my, my boss's uh, policy that gets after education and development of senior enlisted. It includes the service senior enlisted that you heard from yesterday, and it also includes the combatant command senior enlisted. So we're on day two here, and uh, no better way to close out the day than to have a dialogue with all of you. So thanks again for being here. Um, what we'd like to focus on today in terms of uh, three main areas uh, is joint operations and joint forces, global integration, and international partnerships. So let me in introduce uh, my battle buddies and my colleagues here. So on my immediate right is the Pacific Command Senior Enlisted Leader, Sergeant Major Tony Spadaro. To his right is the Strategic Command Senior Enlisted Leader, Chief Master Sergeant Pat McMahon. Next to him is the U European Command Senior Enlisted Leader, Fleet Master Chief Chris Addington. And on the far right is the Transportation Command Senior Enlisted Leader, Chief Master Sergeant Matt Caruso. On my immediate left is the United States Africa Command Senior Enlisted Leader, Chief Master Sergeant Ramon Colon Lopez better known as CZ. Next to him is the Central Command Senior Enlisted Leader, Sergeant Major Bill Thetford. Next to him is the Southern Command Senior Enlisted Leader, Sergeant Major Brian Zikafus. And on the far left is the Special Operations Command Senior Enlisted Leader, Sergeant Major Pat McCauley. Now, unfortunately, our NORAD NORTHCOM Senior Enlisted Leader, uh, Chief Master Sergeant Buddy Hutchinson, could not be here today because uh, he's dealing with a family emergency. So with that, we'll open it up to your questions. Yes, sir. Good to see you again. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I just want you to, if you can be on the record, please. Yesterday's my question as far as U.S.-India relations are concerned, military to military, and so much is happening between the two countries, back and forth, uh, visits and so forth. What and how much, uh, what would you advise to the president or the secretary on the future of the two countries' uh, relations? So I'll, I'll start off by answering that, sir, and then I'll go to the Pacific Command Senior Enlisted Leader, where India is part of his area of responsibility. So the Secretary of Defense, uh, one of his lines of effort is uh, strengthening our alliances and attracting new partners. Uh, we understand to combat the threats around the world uh, that we need strong partnerships and alliances to get after uh, peace and security. So we're going to look globally where we can continue to attract new partners who have shared interests uh, and that we can mutually support each other in uh, peace and security. So, Tony, I'll ask you to talk about uh, specifically India and the PACOM well, India remains one of our most valuable partners that we have in the Indo-Asia Pacific. If you notice even the term Indo-Asia Pacific, and there's a reason for that, because of the demonstrated value of the partnership we've had with them. Uh, mill to mill, it is probably one of the strongest in the PACOM AOR right now. Uh, my boss, Admiral Harris, has had continuing dialogue with the Minister of Defense, with the President, even this, this past year. So when you're looking at for opportunities for advancement in the region, India remains probably the best partner we have in that region right now for increasing that. Uh, if I just quick yeah. follow up, please, I'm sorry to interrupt you. How would you rate as far as uh, India in the, middle, in the middle of two uh, well, adversaries, I would say, or enemies like Pakistan, because there's a terrorism inside Pakistan still today, and there is a China. And how much can you trust Pakistan, or how much can you trust China today? Okay, um, we're not going to address, uh, you know, our uh, dialogue with uh, China in Pakistan, but I can tell you, in terms of uh, global peace and security, as I mentioned earlier, and getting after the threats, where it be aggression from a nation state or a non-state actor committing violent extremist uh, uh, kind of attacks or anything, we're going to continue to look for ways to strengthen our relationships globally to better combat those threats. And I'll ask you to come back on that in terms of India. Well, as, if anything, you know, India is part of our ongoing efforts to fight anything with, with, with against counterterrorism. So, so they're with us 
all in. So I, I don't see where that's the issue where you're trying to identify two other countries. I think the most part is that we're working together. And that partnership also demonstrates to the allies a position of strength. And I think that's the more important thing that you need to look at, is that the U.S. and India together comes from a position of strength to the rest of the region. Okay, ma'am, you had your hand up first back there. I'll go to you. Thank you so much. I actually have a, a quick question for Pacific Command and Africa Command and Special Operations Command. So I'll start with the Pacific. Um, with this current recent launch in North Korea, what more can you tell us about this launch? Uh, do you have any additional details for us, and how does that affect your troops? No, ma'am, I can't speak even at a hypothetical right now. We, we just, everyone, as everyone knows, we know it, hap it had just happened today. Um, you know, the, the continued missile and nuclear test that does, does demonstrate that North Korea poses not only a threat to the United States, but to our allies as well and in, into the region. And um, this is what we have to look at right now. It's just part of the continuing process. So as it develops, we'll know more. But right now, it's too early to tell you what is going on. Thank you. On, on Africa, uh, have you been seeing an increase in movement uh, for Islamic State fighters into different pockets in Africa? We've, we've seen the reports coming out, in street, increase in strikes in Somalia against Islamic State 4 in the past month. We've seen what has happened in Niger. We've seen additional strikes in Libya. So can you lay that out for us? What is the threat of Islamic State in Africa currently? Well, first of all, uh, we need to identify that the threat is there. Uh, second, the increase in strikes has to do with authorities that we didn't previously have until last year. And that's when we started exercising that authority to get out there. So naturally, you're going to have more uh, attacks on the enemies. <clears throat> and uh, lastly, with regards to the spread of ISIS, um, pretty much everything that you're getting on open source is, uh, is what we're seeing. You have flows of uh, foreign fighters that went from Africa to fight in Iraq and Syria, and they're coming back. And uh, our job right now is to be able to contain them and keep the pressure on the network to prevent further spread. Where are you most concerned about Islamic State spreading? Well, we're concerned in the continent writ large for a lot of different reasons, primarily the, the youth bulge in Africa. Because right now we have a country that you're focused on. Well, you realize that the entire continent is about 50% uh, under the age of 24. Uh, very few opportunities, which is clearly concerning because when you have even the, the smallest of pockets of these VEOs and they're providing opportunities to the, to the youth of Africa, it's clearly concerning to us. And then finally, with Special Operations Command, we've been seeing an increase in, in the reliance on Special Operations Forces across the globe. Uh, what's, your, what's your force level? Are you confident that you can still handle all of the missions that you're being tasked with, or have you had to say no? to some of the recent missions. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, we certainly are at a sustainable level um, to maintain across the globe, but, but that doesn't come easily. Uh, we are always evaluating the mission sets that we're doing forward and working through, by, and with our partners to make sure we build capacity so that they're able to solve the problems themselves. It's kind of a force multiplier. Um, at SOCOM, we use a process, the, the global synchronization of soft forces. And essentially what that means is we look at the forces available, we balance that against GCC requirements around the globe, and then we allocate forces to meet those requirements. Um, and right now we feel like we're in a pretty good place with that, but again, it's a constantly ongoing process where we're evaluating, divesting of some missions that we may or may not be doing, and then moving into other areas. Ma'am, if I could just add on from a OSD perspective, we know that the, the threat of ISIS and violent extremists, they're a trans-regional kind of threat. Um, obviously, you know, born out of places like the Middle East, but it's spilled over into Africa, as uh, Chief Colon Lopez talked, and it's, we've seen attacks in Europe, but we've also seen them in the Pacific as well. So when we talk global integration, it's key that all of us here work together, and from a perspective of uh, by, with, and through our partners and building partner capacity, it's important for us to be focused on things like developing small unit leaders, specifically their non-commissioned officer corps, that can execute discipline initiative within commander or officer's intent and accomplish the mission. When you talk about Africa, and I'm gonna come back to my battle buddy here, and I'd ask, he just had a very spectacular event that I had the opportunity to come and speak at, as well as uh, Sergeant Major McCauley and Fleet Addington over here, um, his AFRICOM Senior Enlisted Leader Conference. The first one of its nature that's ever happened and I'll let you talk about that in the level of attendance and the level of dialogue. Uh, certainly, SEAC. So 
for the first time ever, we were able to have a continent-wide senior enlisted leader conference. And a lot of it was uh, synchronization with our partners to be able to maximize the capabilities in the continent. Uh, by virtue of the sharing COCOMs with regards to operations in Africa, we extended the invitation to CENCOM, SOCOM, UCOM, amongst others, including NATO and the SEAC, and also Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force was present, just to be able to have a dialogue over four days on what are some of the things and initiatives that we need to be getting more aggressive on and what uh, methods we need to further utilize to ensure that they have professional forces that are, uh, number one, obedient to the rule of law and that are able to go ahead and affect security in the region. Uh, the event went great and uh, I will quote the African partners when they stated at the end, and I quote, we came here as uh, NCOs of our country we live here as NCOs for Africa. We need to tackle these problems together. So I guess finally, to just to yeah. follow up with your, since you opened it up. Yeah. Uh, so where in the globe do you see most of the ISIS fighters going right now? Well, as we continue to liberate areas in the Middle East, like we just liberated uh, Raqqa, we, I should say, our partners that uh, we are advising uh, and assisting, um, they're going to continue to look for areas that they can uh, build capacity, and continue to do the kinds of activities they've done before. So we have to be sensitive to that. So when we talk about ISIS or violent extremists as a threat, you know, years before we used to talk at it as a CENTCOM problem. Now it's a global problem that requires all of our bosses to be involved in working together to get after this threat. Okay, sir, I'll go with you next. Hi, I'm Kevin Barron from Defense One, and I'll continue on Carla's question, um, the SOCOM and some of the others. Um, with the expansion uh, and spread of terrorism, the projection that there's going to be more fighting, more by, with, and through, more troops on the border in Europe, um, all of this is under this, this umbrella of readiness that we're talking about in Washington a lot about. Can some of you just give some of the metrics that, that are on your mind right now of, of how you're measuring and what you need for your forces, for when it comes to equipment or pace of rotational deployments, whatever it is, just give us a sense of, of where things are now and why you're in Washington, what's your ask to this town, to, to, your, to yeah. your leaders here. Of so what if you don't mind, sir, I'll talk from a sure. Defense Department perspective, then I'll ask for my battle buddies. So we, we understand that we have some readiness challenges. Um, 16 years of high operational tempo and then unstable budgets have caused us to you know, defer some modernization programs that we needed to get after. It's caused us not to be able to get after maintenance programs we needed to get after. And it's caused some of our service members to use worn out equipment. So what we need to get after this readiness is we need a stable budget that allows us to get after line of effort number one by the secretary. And that's adding, building a larger, more capable force and a more lethal force as we go forward. So I'll ask, uh, uh, Fleet Master Chief uh, Chris Addington from UCOM for his comments on that. I'll ask another one and then I'll go down to SOCOM. Yeah, so go ahead. Thank you for the question, first of all. And, and from, a, from a European Command's perspective, uh, the, the, big, uh, the, the big ask, uh, per se, is as we develop uh, the ready and postured forces uh, for Europe, the, the rotation of the armored brigade combat teams, uh, the, uh, the the build out of the uh, the aviation units, uh, the build out of the sea, uh, in order to deter uh, and and focus on on uh, building partner capacity uh, within the region. That's probably the biggest to work on uh, uh, making sure uh, that it's not a U.S. only. So you tie the by with and through, but it's but it's. It's, it's about working together and being interoperable. It's not about just building something. It's about building the right things. And so uh, from, from the European perspective, it's, it's, it's make, working through NATO to make sure that all the nations are working together, developing the right way so that we're all uh, looking at the same things. And I'll ask uh, U.S. Strategic Command, Chief Master Sergeant Pat McMahon, if you can talk about some of those 
challenges. Hey, thank you, Siak. You know, from our perspective, really, when you look at our portfolio, you know, my, my, my boss's priorities, uh, General Heighton, his number one priority is strategic deterrence. And so from a strategic deterrence perspective, how do you have to look through it? And it really is now, in this day and age, it's really how, do you, how does 21st century strategic deterrence differentiate from 20th century? And it's exceedingly different because the environment's changed. And typically when I talk to individuals, to me it's like you have to have a comprehensive understanding of the threat in the strategic environment that's out there. And things have changed. For, you know, if you look back 25 plus years ago, we're in a Cold, cold War posture, it was really a bipolar world. And then you look at the complexity and uncertainties of today, where it really is a multipolar world. And as you look at the strategic capabilities that our command provides, whether it's, it's the nuclear deterrent, whether you look across space capabilities, cyber capabilities, a as you look, there has been a recognition. So right now, modernization across the nuclear portfolio, investments in space, investments in cyber, it's been recognized that we have to move out on that because it really is how do you ultimately integrate and, and aggregate effects at the time and place that you're choosing. Okay, and then I'll ask Central Command. Okay, so from, uh, from Central Command, it's a similar theme to uh, what my teammates have already said. Yes, we have uh, aging equipment, and I'd say it keeps our maintainers pretty busy to keep it running. Sometimes the equipment runs because we have some creative young folks that uh, are motivated and want to just get the job done. Would they like new equipment? Absolutely. But not because it, their desire comes from a sense of entitlement. It's because they want to be successful and they want to get after the mission. And we'll close out on this question with SOCOM. Certainly, like has uh, been discussed, you know, budget concerns always are going to be uh, forefront in any discussion about this. But, but you touched on something else with the spreading of, of terrorism across the globe. Um, we've been at war for 16 years. That, that is a reality. And in SOF, we certainly have felt that uh, with a little bit more of a senior age-wise uh, force. So, you know, our average age is a little bit more than you see across the military. Fortunately for us, um, the Department of Defense, as well as Congress, have allowed us to have programs to help deal with those realities. Um, in our case, the Preservation of the Force and the Family Initiative, which helps us look at the, the spiritual do domain, the physical domain, the social domain, all these in the psychological domain, to help ensure long term that we're able to keep people in the fight as this continues to go on generationally. You get that good reviews. I'm sorry? You get that good reviews. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Can I follow up with SOCOM and AFRICOM about um, just the, ge the geographic size of Africa alone is a concern. To, so when you, when you talk to some folks about what's coming next, uh, is that something that you're, you're talking about, you're preparing for, you're concerned with? Absolutely. It's a great question. And, and it, Africa represents a challenge, and I'll, and I'll pass it over to the uh, AFRICOM cell here in a minute. Obviously, um, as, as we discussed, you know, our enemies are going to go where we're not. They're going to go to ungoverned space. They're going to go to places where they can get freedom of, of maneuver. Those particular locations present challenges. They present challenges when you start talking about logistically, how do you support folks that are in the fight forward? I mean, that is a challenge that we're constantly looking at and developing new and better ways to be able to facilitate operations in those types of areas. Yeah, so, you know, as I stated before, the youth bulge is really concerning to us because uh, where do foreign fighters go? Where do they decide to grow their manning pool? If you look at Africa right now, there's uh, 1.2 billion people there. By 2050, it's estimated that it's going to double to 2.4. And what happens when you have 600 million youth right now without any opportunities for education or jobs? And then uh, every year that passes by, you have 11 million more entering that uh, empty pool of labor that they're either going to migrate, they're going to go ahead and join VEOs. We just don't know what's going to happen. So from a national security perspective, I, I think it's imperative that we stare at the African problem because it can potentially be a hotbed for terrorism in the future. And that is just on, based on facts and data. Okay, Jim, we'll go to you and then Tara will go next. Thanks, uh, Sergeant Major. I've heard partnership, I've heard by, with, and through from all of you. And a lot of the countries that you deal with don't have an NCO Corps. And I have to wonder what they think when they meet you guys. Um, do they want to emulate you? Do they, what do they want from you when you go out and, and talk to these, uh, these, uh, these people yeah. in these nations? So I'm going to start off on that. And then I'm going to ask Sergeant Major Zikafus from Southcom to follow me. Um, so, Jim, it it's kind of goes both ways. Sometimes culture of the country, you know, they can't overcome um, their culture to have empowered enlisted leaders to get after business. So for 27 months, I served on U.S. Forces Korea, and it was challenging to get them, because they were conscription military, 
And, uh, you know, because of culture, it was tough to get them to empower small unit NCO leaders and trust them to get after mission command. Now, also, they haven't had the combat experience that we've had over the past 16 years. And we've learned over the last 16 years that you can expand the commander's reach and their area of responsibility by empowering enlisted leaders. But that has to come through training, education, and then you have trust. And when you have trust, you can empower those enlisted leaders. But then there's others. You know, Sergeant Major Spadaro and I just recently went to Taiwan. And, uh, you know, uh, we were asked by their chief of defense, hey, what do I need to do to get after more efficient, small unit kind of operations? And we talked about NCO development and empowerment. And we thought it was a two-tier approach from bottom up and top down. So your small unit NCO courses and things like that that can gear small unit leaders to get after the things they need to get after, like pre-combat inspections, training, you know, and stuff like that. But they also needed somebody at the top who had grown up in this military and can tell them uh, what's going on and where they need to go. So we recommended that the CHOD appoint a SEAC. And uh, two months ago, they appointed their first SEAC, and he just recently returned uh, from Taiwan on a visit. So I'll ask you to t comment on that right quick, and then Z will come down to you. You, you know, that, that, that's a great question because this is what we're seeing in, in the Indo-Asia Pacific. It, it, it's a growing awareness of the asymmetric advantage by having an empowered NCO Corps. So, for example, when the SEAC and I was in Taiwan in May, their child looked right at me and goes, what do I need to do? And the SEAC looked at him and says, you need a SEAC. And he named one two weeks later, and it took about a couple months to get in place. I just left there last week, and I had a great conversation with him. And he said, you know what? My boss is making me put together a five-year plan of what direction we need to do better NCO growth development. So there's an example. I was in Singapore two weeks ago, and I watched an empowered NCO corps dealing directly between officer and enlisted seamlessly. We had our, our CHOD SEL conference this year. Two years ago, I had six SEACs show up to it. This year we had 16. So to me, there's a growing awareness. And how we get to that growing awareness is when you see the gentlemen at this table here, when they're traveling with their bosses, and our partners see this too, they're saying, hey, there's a validity, there's a value of having empowered senior enlisted leader. Sri Lanka just named one, and we're hoping to keep growing this in the region. So in the Indo-Asia Pacific, we see a growth in this right now. Okay, Z, go ahead. Just, just as CX said and the Sergeant Major uh, uh, said there, it's, it's about leadership. It's about, you know, development. Uh, we go to these, part, these nations and they see us sitting next to our, our admirals, our generals, and they say, how do you affect? What do you affect? And we tell them that they want the same thing as we do. We talk about the imperatives. We talk about, as the U.S. Southern Command, the four imperatives, NCO development, human rights, being joint, and then gender integration and perspective. They want the same things we do. They just, they're trying to get it at the same time. Okay, Tara, go ahead. Thank you, um, Tara Pop, Military Times. I have a couple of questions. Um, I wanted to get back to the strategic de deterrence piece and ask both uh, Stratcom and Paycom, what does success look like for North Korea? Is it a North Korea that um, has ballistic missile capability, but is contained. The Pentagon just confirmed that it was an IC. Sorry, I'm still getting over this. An ICBM that was launched. Um, so, is success a contained North Korea? Is it a North Korea with no nuclear program? If you could just just talk to us a little bit about that. So, yes, Pat, Pat, please. Well, thank you for the question. You know, I would offer right now, if you look from from the military dimension, it really is in support of diplomacy right now. You, you look, you know, nationally and as well as our regional allies, it really is about how do you put pressure on that regime to change behavior. And so from, from a policy perspective, I, I think ultimately you have seen denuclearization is the ultimate goal. But right now from the military dimension, and what, what are we doing from a you know, broad our command perspective and to deter and as importantly assure our allies in the region as well. And so as you've looked over as, as, as North Korea has, has ramped up their cycle really over the last 18 months, if you will, 
the, the, the actions that we've taken with our, with our allies in the region. And so I traveled with General Hyten over the summer in, into, uh, into Sergeant Major Spadaro's AOR and, and visited United States Forces Korea with, where General Brooks and Command Sergeant Major Payton reside at and spent time there, spent time with the United States Forces Japan and, and met with both, you know, our joint partners there as well as our allied partners. And to really it is, it's about solidifying that, that, that assurance piece and, and collaborating ultimately to sit there to, to support diplomacy, our State Department and our, our national security apparatus. And, and, and Tara, I'm just going to just re echo those remarks. You know, we're, we're just going to seek the peaceful denuclearization of that peninsula. And, and that's our U.S. stance, and that's how the only way we need to get about it right now. But is that possible at this point? It seems North Korea is pretty bent on continuing both its but That's president. why we're hoping for, for diplomatic solutions at this point. And, and, and right now, if you look at it, I, I got that there was a test today. But there's also a continuing diplomatic process that's been going on. And, and I think from that diplomatic process, if you, if you look at the calculus behind that, there is achieved effects right now. And it's also, you know, we're also demonstrating to our allies, we're demonstrating to the partners also into the region that we're all into this. And I think they want a peaceful and a denuclearization of the peninsula. Um, and I think if you remember on the trip we just went on together to Korea, um, you know, as General Dunford and Secretary Mattis got after the military committee meetings and security consultative meetings, I did what I'm charged to do, and that's go out and check on the troops. So I went up to the demilitarized zone to check on the ROC troops. I went and talked to the U.S. troops because I wanted them to understand that um, even though we, nobody wants high-end conflict with Korea, the bottom line, we're charged uh, by our commander-in-chief to be prepared to fight and win if we have to. So not only, as we, this gets back to the uh, multinational part of this, not only was I out there checking on the U.S. forces, but it was the Korean forces as well. Uh, because in the end, not only is it going to be a combined forces command fight, but our United Nations sending states are going to be involved as well. So I think that's what we have to focus on, is making sure we're getting after uh, the level of readiness and preparedness that we need in case we have to go to war. Go ahead. I thought you had a problem. I do have two yeah. more. Uh, for so calm. Um, Way to hide things. <laughs> <laughs> We're coming over here next. Christina, you got to get fired up, all right? <laughs> um, for so calm, what is uh, your dwell right now for enlisted going, you know, with all of the various countries that you, U.S. forces are in right now, is it above a one to one dwell or where are you all at? Um, overall, we're above a one to one dwell. Certainly, it's episodic across our force. You know, there are. The vast majority of our forces within an acceptable norm, uh, you know, in all honesty in, in special forces, we're still working towards getting there. Um, we, are, we are above a one to one, but we're not where we want to be at a one to two or a one to three at this point. It is an ongoing challenge and one that we keep looking at every day. Um, I think we are on a glide path to get to those, um, those dwells uh, long term, and I, th I think we're in a good spot um, going forward, but I don't want to paint any. Um, you know, rosy picture here. It is a challenge that we, we, we are dealing with, um, but it is tenable right now. So without getting too specific, it's just slightly above one to one. I mean, that seems to put an incredible amount of strain on your forces and their families. Certainly there's strains on the forces and the families as well. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the POTA program we use to, to help, you know, facilitate alleviating some of that stress to include some programs for the family members, for the wives and, and, and the, the support infrastructure uh, for all of our folks. Um, most of SF will tell you that right now at a, at a one to two that we feel like it's sustainable. Long-term goals, we have parts of our force that are at one to three. Um, others based on, you know, really skill set are at a, at a one to a, maybe a 1.2, 1.5, um, which is not where we want to be optimally, but it's been gliding and, and trending towards much better we want it to be. Thank you. Um, I just have one more, I promise. Uh, from, uh, from yesterday, um, one of the programs that the uh, Pentagon has used to bring in recruits with needed skills, especially translators, is, is Reach Out Everywhere, is the MAVNI program. I was just wondering if you could talk about the value that you've seen in that program and whether it's something, as the Pentagon assesses it, uh, you think should be continued. Well, I'll, I'll start off with that and then I'll ask for uh, my colleagues to comment. I think, uh, first of all, um, these programs are very important, especially when we're looking at bringing in talent that can allow us to be more of an enabler or a facilitator to the force that we're conducting security force assistance with or whatever. Um, and that we ought to look at that as a way of 
building on uh, the competitive warfighting advantage that we're trying to get in the human domain. We already own a significant uh, advantage in the human domain because of our empowered enlisted force. But programs like MAVNI just allow us to get after that even more. And I'll ask anybody else have comments on this. Don't all talk at once. Answer. Answer. Think, Perfectly. Yeah. If you don't mind, I mean, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. you can add diversity to the game. Yeah. I mean, you, know, you talk across the force, and and adding uh, adding those pieces and that ability uh, uh, just makes us a stronger force. So, and I would even go as far, and Matt, I'll ask you to comment on this down there. So, Transcom perspective, <coughs> uh, what we need in terms of military sea lift and air mobility and uh, surface deployment and distribution. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we have to go to civilian type stuff and everything. So can you comment on that uh, in, in terms of what we need and to get after and then how people that are in this MAVNI program can assist us as we're doing these overseas kind of uh, movements and deployments? All right. Thanks, Siak. I appreciate it. And thanks, Tara, for the perspective and the question. Um, you know, from a transportation mobility logistics standpoint and as it relates to defense and all the things we're trying to do uh, to help the global security environment, honestly, um, I think a lot of our allies and partners, um, especially the ones up and coming, buying more equipment, buying more airplanes and, and more sea lift or w weapons, whatever, what, what have you, uh, they forget a lot of time there's a sustainment tail that comes, that comes with that. There's a bill on maintenance and supply and sustainment. And um, we have to do, I think, uh, we could do a better job. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of opportunity here for us to grow and show our allies and our partners what that looks like uh, over the long-term life of a weapon system, say, or whatever capability our partners buy, purchase, and what have you. But as far as our, our um, enterprise goes, you know, I'd say that Air Mobility Command, um, Surface Deployment Distribution Command, and Military Shield Command, and our commercial partners, which General McDo calls our fourth component appropriately, um, we are fielding just about everything we can right now as far as uh, meeting the requirements of the, all of the COCOMs, right? So we're a functional combatant command, just like my teammates in STRATCOM, SOCOM, and, so, and now CYBERCOM, but we have global responsibilities, and that comes with a, a huge bill, obviously, uh, to, our, to our forces, but our capability as far as our weapon systems go. And um, when you think about General McDo's authorities and the, the uh, equipment he's responsible for to execute the nation's wars or supply the forces for the nation's wars, um, they're strategic assets, and they take a long time to build. They, they take a long time to pay for. And so when we get into the, the piece where we have CRs, uh, when we get into the piece where um, the budgets have been somewhat uh, stable or flat over many years now, it's hard to purchase more ships, and that's, that's what we're asking for. And we consistently uh, message to Congress and our leaders that we need more ships for the out years. We need more airplanes. We'd like to see <coughs> the KC-46 come online soon. Um, we're excited about that and other assets. But thanks for asking the question, Siak, and, yeah. and give me an opportunity. Terry, if I can close that. out with the MAVNI thing. So just a personal example. In 2007 and 8, during the surge into Iraq, I was a striker brigade command sergeant major. And my interpreter was an Army 09 Lima, if you remember the program where they brought people in specifically to be interpreters. However, he was a soldier. He was a rifleman, and so not only was he a lethal part of my force to be able to de defeat any threat, but because he was an interpreter and he could help me in my key leader engagements, he helped me with the <coughs> non-lethal stuff, which w was as important as the lethal stuff. So I think those kind of programs, we have to continue to have those kind of programs to get after a capability that we're going to need in the future as we continue to be this expeditionary force. So thanks. Okay, man shoes, rock and roll. <coughs> That's right, yeah. That, uh, that years ago in Iraq. Um, 2007 and 8 in Iraq. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. 4 9 infantry, right? Man um, shoes. Go ahead. So, on the right hand side of the table over here, we've got a tremendous amount, decades of special operations experience in the, in the persons of these three gentlemen uh, you know, Command Sergeant Major McCauley, Command Sergeant Major Thetford, and uh, uh, Chief, Chief Master Sergeant. Yes, Ronald Lopez. Okay. Ronald Lopez. Uh, so I wanted to ask. That wasn't by design, by the way. Uh, yeah, I, I got to talk to my guy over here. <laughs> I wanted to ask kind of a longer term question about you know the way roles and roles of SOF have changed in the time that you guys have been in the force. You know, ten years ago we would hear a lot about how SOF was all into direct action. Everybody was doing direct action. Now we, now it's kind of the opposite. I mean, it seems like everybody does by, with, and through in foreign internal defense. You've got SEAL platoons doing it, MSOTs doing it. You even got 
I mean, I don't know if you could have imagined when you were a you know, young ranger at Fort Lewis, um, Sergeant Major Thetford, if you could have imagined rangers now doing the kind of stuff they do with the Katehas today in Afghanistan. So as you kind of circulate around the force and talk to special operators who've been at this a long time, I mean, what do they think of this evolution? What do guys think of kind of everything being by, with, and through, everything being with partners? I mean, I certainly know special operators who, um, who joined the force exactly to do that, and I know ones who joined the force exactly not to do that, right? Um, so I, I just wonder if you could sort of speak to how this sits with the force, how guys adapt to doing it in these many, many different theaters, um, you know, everywhere from, uh, from West Africa to the Philippines to everywhere in between. Yeah, well, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So for some of our forces, like you said, they, by nature, are direct action force. So there's a bit of an evolution for them, to kind of understand that, you know, right now what we need them to do is work with a partner force and, and use that by with through approach. And over time, if you communicate to the troops why it's important and you kind of give them a chance to, to buy into it, then they get it. And you mentioned the Rangers and the Katehas and they've done a phenomenal job. And that's just one good example of a direct action unit that kind of grabbed onto the, uh, you know, the lead and, and buy with through, and they've done a great job at it. I think if you look at the evolution of SOF, or really the history of SOF, what you'll see is we've always been very opportunistic on how we engage our enemies. We've been able to change based upon the threat, based upon the environment, and found unique and differing ways to always get after the enemy. Um, so I don't think this is anything new. I think it's really a matter of emphasis. Foreign internal defense, irregular warfare, unconventional warfare, special reconnaissance, all those tasks have been in the books forever. Um, it's just we've started to emphasize those more with certain units taking on increased responsibility. A great problem that we have is that our folks want to be out there on the tip of the spear. Mm -hmm. And certainly you're going to have folks that want to be out on the battlefield, you know, going back and forth with the enemy. Um, those folks are not always going to be ecstatic initially to, okay, we're going to train a partner force to be able to conduct operations. This is a good problem for us to have because our people want to be out there. So it takes a pretty, pretty consistent communication from us. But once they understand the effect that they can have, um, and, and really through partners and with partners, how it's exponentially bigger than just themselves and their organization, they, they almost universally buy into that and are very thankful to have the opportunity to continue to serve their nation in that capacity. It's easy. So since the early days when we first uh, deployed to Afghanistan, clearly SOF had a specific niche uh, mission, i.e. direct action and so on. But as the years went by, you have to realize that SOF is a very, very small pool. And being smart about the way that we fight wars, we train other people to go ahead and take over some of those missions so that they can go ahead and spread the span of control in the battlefield. So what you see there is uh, just a, a few subtle differences uh, due to the nature of war today. It's very regular. And now you have conventional infantry units that are carrying out soft-like missions. But uh, soft always has a specific advantage with the way they operate that is uh, secretive, for lack of better words, just because it's that element of surprise that gives this man the advantage. And here, soon, uh, women. So, so that's what you're seeing today. Yeah. If I could finish this one off from a DOD perspective. In terms of risk to the force and risk to mission, if you remember back when we had 150,000 troops in Iraq, look at April of 2004. We lost 140 Americans in action in that month, hundreds severely wounded. And we were trying to build this capacity in the Iraqi security force. We were trying to defeat an insurgency. Uh, so now look where we came at with the strategy we have now, where we have this by, with, and through this build partner capacity, train, advise, and assist, and in some cases with our special operations forces that have the authorities, they will accompany the partner force under certain, under certain restrictions, though. But the risk to our force has significantly dropped. In 2011 and 12, I was the Sergeant Major of all combat forces in Afghanistan as the ISAF Joint Command Sergeant Major. All of our patrols were partnered, but the majority of the casualties were U.S. and coalition, more so than Afghan. Now, I'm not wishing any harm on our Afghan partners, but if we're building the capacity into our partners, then they need to be in the lead. So as we reduced formations, and it caused us to do more through our partners and everything. So the risk to our force has gone down. The risk to the mission of stability and security has gone down. But more importantly, it's caused the risk to our institutions over the long haul to come down as we move forward. So ma'am, I'll go to you. 
up on yeah on go ahead one. then ma'am i'm gonna get you and christina i'm coming to you after that um, and then uh, sir i'll get you over here. on the you know the stretching force thing that tara brought up uh with regard to soft um do, can you guys say whether i mean is the the one is the dwell issue is that worse with the kind of the building block teams of the force the msots and the odas and the seal platoons or is it worse with the the headquarters units you know the battalion or squadron level elements they're going over there and staffing all these task forces well certainly there's challenges with the headquarters elements going forward I would say from the from um, the overall perspective, it's really with our enabler population that you see a lot of stress on the force. The folks that do those very specialized mission sets, the intelligence folks, the communicators, they're the ones that have a recurrent mission that whenever you stand up a headquarters forward, they're the folks that fall in on that. So certainly they have felt um, quite a bit of strain across their force. Okay, yes ma'am. Hi, Caroline Hack with Defense One. Um, just a quick question for UCOM. Um, with now that we're kind of nearing a year in with the uh, the first year of the EFP battle groups um, and the EDI is becoming more entrenched and more stabilized into the base budget, there's some talk now about whether the rotational um, deployment is the correct approach and whether we should whether it should switch to a permanent uh, permanent stationing. So I'm wondering what you're hearing from troops on the ground. Is there a desire for that uh, permanent basing, or are they are they gaining value from their rotational heel to toe? What are what are you hearing? Um, first of all, thank you. Um, but, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the look and from the troops, um, you know, on the ground, uh, uh working through, we've worked through the three, four, uh, rotational, uh, brigade, uh, we're now, uh, two, one is over there, just relieved them. Uh, and and it's really about deterrence and it's about being able to provide the force structure um, to deter aggression uh, in this case from Russia um, and you know the numbers show that we need about a division's worth of material uh, there in Europe in order to properly deter now that's not move a whole division there and reestablish that division but that's a division worth, whether that's using, uh, you know, uh, forces that are currently stationed there, along with the rotation units, along with the APS uh, the units, uh, the, the uh, preposition stores that we have. So those three combined to make up a division worth of stuff, we feel along with our, our counterparts, our, our NATO allies and partners is what we need uh, on the uh, on the European continent in order to deter further aggression uh, from Russia. Siak, may, may I address that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'd like to, uh, Carolyn, thanks. I'd like to address it from uh, how we're, we view ourselves as a superpower and the projection of forces. And, and the, Europe, uh, the European uh, AOR is a good example. Thankfully, in the last 18 months or so, we've had, uh, I'll just say the Army as an example as well, an Army on the move. And uh, commanders in the Army have responded to our call to ensure that we know how to ship our equipment mm -hmm. from the CONUS to the ports and from the ports across the oceans or flying them um, if required, but more so the sea lift option into the ports of Northern Europe um, to understand the challenges of getting equipment down into Europe, uh, you know, delivering that decisive force. And I'd offer that, you know, we, that really, our projection, our ability to project or anywhere in the world whether overnight with uh, airlift or in a decisive way uh, over three or four months, a brigade combat team and so on, or other, and other major equipment and, and personnel delivery, um, that's what makes us a superpower. It, the only country in the world that can do that. And our men and women all across all of our services, all across all of our COCOMs and the headquarters that, that run those, uh, those uh, operations, it's just an incredible synergistic uh, enterprise that you just, you gotta be proud of. In, in fact, uh, with everything we have on our plate and all of the, uh, the, the equipment that's getting older and older every day, the, the young men and women of America that join our service continue to crush it every night. And that, I can't tell you how proud we are up here to serve uh, for them. Christina, okay. go ahead. So both my questions were taken by other people, so <laughs> I've had to make some up on the fly. Um, <laughs> especially after you called me out. <laughs> uh, is there an increasing reliance on special operations forces in your AORs and why? Um, and secondly, does the military need to shift to get on this by, with, and through uh, footing? Does, what adjustments need to be made? 
So I'll, I'm going to frame this, Christina, from a DOD perspective, and then I'm going to ask Sergeant Major Zikafus and Sergeant Major Spadaro uh, to comment on this. So, and I think CZ kind of started off talking about this. We're looking for ways to get after, are there missions out there where well-trained general purpose forces can move in and do the job that we previously had special operations forces doing under the right training guidance, under the right authorities and things like that? The answer is yes, and we, we're doing that. Uh, across theaters where because of the experience we've had over 16 years of decentralized kind of operations and this foreign internal defense kind of stuff that Sergeant Major McCauley talked about, um, our general purpose forces are conditioned uh, through a, a training program and everything to do those kind of things. So we're constantly looking at that so that we can alleviate some of the stress on our special operations forces. Uh, Z, go ahead. So we have a very small footprint of special operations forces, and we'd always take more. But the reality is, you know, we we get a special purpose MAGTAF that comes down about half the way through the year and works HADR and also works other missions within, you know, within our Central America and, and South America where they actually get with their partner nations and build that partner capacity, you know, from everything from, you know, NCO development to shooting, swimming, all those things we need to you know, to build that partner capacity. So yes, you know, always need more, but in reality is we can do the same thing with the forces we have today. Go ahead. You know, Special Operations <clears throat> Command Pacific has been absolutely magnificent for us. And they, they, what they have done for us, it, it's just, they're not, a, they're, they're, they're beyond a partner builders for us. They, they, they have literally, they're, they're unintended diplomats for us. We're seeing our, our, our PAC teams doing magnificent work. And, and the really cool thing about it, it's done by enlisted men and women that are assigned to them that are doing just the work of angels for us over there. But with that too, we also see an excess of that we've carefully integrated conventional forces because they do need relief over there because of the <coughs> workload, it just keeps increasing in the Pacific for our special operators. So we have seen success with, as Sergeant Major Zikafu said, when you have the special mag task come in, but we also said when we introduced our UAS assets to bring relief to them. And they, they've integrated magnificently, and I think because, as the SEAC keeps alluding, and everyone here, 16 years have just proven time and time again how to make this work. So what's the future hold? And I think that's where we have to start taking a, a deeper look is, how are we gonna carefully integrate conventional forces to alleviate some of the mission sets to our special operators. Go ahead, Susie, you want to come? So just wanted to give you a quick example. We have a lot of places in Africa where literacy rates are not really all that great. You're talking about 60% of them can read or write. Um, then you have a, a soft, a specific force that goes in to train them. And uh, in essence, the, the training that soft may provide may be too specialized for the capacity and capabilities and sustainability of, of that particular force to where we may be better served by having a basic infantry unit, teach them how to shoot, move, communicate, and do basic uh, <coughs> life-saving skills. So there's a lot of places that we employ soft because soft has done this for a long time. I mean, it's one of their core missions. But does the shoe fit every time? Absolutely not. I think sometimes we need to go ahead and rely on other assets to be able to provide that relief to get after those dwell rates to make sure that we allow our soft forces to train for soft missions. Um, so just to close this out, one of the strong programs we have in our National Guard is our state partnership programs yeah. that are around the world. And so Fleet Addington and I were in Ukraine uh, several months back. And what I saw out there that I thought was pretty unique and pretty good was that we had soft forces out there training uh, soft tasks to uh, Ukrainian forces, but we had National Guard non-commissioned officers out there teaching small unit leadership to Ukrainian NCOs, another country that badly needs this empowered small unit leadership to get after the challenges they're having in the eastern part of the country there. So that was a pretty good example that I saw from there. Yes, sir. Uh, Phil Stewart from Reuters. Um, I was hoping to get your thoughts on uh, one of the partner forces, uh, particularly in, in Syria. You know, what, what do you think the, 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 the kind of the folks on the ground there, our partners, will need to transition from a kind of clear force to a, to a whole force and kind of looking, looking ahead? You know, what, what, are the, what are the shortcomings and, and uh, where do you think the U.S. Uh, has to? So I'll that? ask the CENTCOM senior enlisted leader to sure. comment on that. So you're speaking of our <coughs> SDF, Syrian Democratic Forces. Well, they're getting, they're getting practice at it right now because they'll, 
tactically go in, do a mission, clear ISIS from an area, and then before they move on to their next tactical objective, they leave behind a civil council to stand up basic services for the population. Because we know if you don't govern, you've got a limited amount of time or that vacuum will be filled by the next group of terrorists. So the SDF is uh, not only are they good fighters, but they're good at leaving behind a, uh, a civil council to take care of the population. I guess what I'm wondering is what happens to fighters and what do you think your role is, is trying to make sure that they're they're trained right to, to transition to a whole force because you know part of the job is not just to create the social and the governmental uh, conditions to prevent a return of ISIS but also to ensure that you have the military uh, cohesion and staying power because it's easy to be united when you're fighting an enemy but when that fight's not so obvious things can get complicated so people can faction off. I'm just sort of wondering how you're looking at that more specific military problem. I don't know that we've uh, kind of tackled that just yet. Right now uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces are busy in their, in their clearance of ISIS from East Syria. Once, uh, once they get to where they're going to have their limit of advance, then we've got to look and see what, what do they do? What is their long-term future? Is there a model you're going to look at? Is there some other force that you might be a model for you as you look to how to move the Syrians into the next phase of the fight? I, I think it's, uh, every, every case is going to be unique. And so I think what the SDF have earned is a is a seat at the table to see what, what comes next for Syria as a whole. So if I could add on to that, and I'll ask Sergeant Major McCauley and I, what, about a month ago, a month and a half, we were okay. in Raqqa, Syria, and got to see the SDF in action. And I will tell you, as I mentioned yesterday, um, we were on the ground for four hours, and I don't know how they were holding out from all of the lethality that the SDF, along with us assisting them, were putting on them. But as they continue to pursue this enemy, one thing we've noticed is that the minute they let up, this is a very resilient enemy that will come back and attack and uh, try to look for vulnerabilities to come after and get them. So uh, we're going to continue to support the SDF. They've got a lot of hard fighting to do, like Sergeant Major Thetford said, and we're going to continue to uh, support them as we continue this effort to uh, uh, liberate more areas along the Euphrates River Valley and also continue to get after the defeat of ISIS. Anything you want to add on it? Just say that the, the SDF is a unique partner in that, you know, it's made up of you have Sunnis and Shia, you have Christians, you have, you know, Arabs and Kurds, males and females all in, in one organization. And what we can look at holistically is we can look at their body of work, what they've accomplished, how far they've gone, and what they've done in their wake. Um, because that, in a lot of ways, is going to be an indicator of what we can expect in the future. And I can tell you that as the SEAC and I traveled across country, it was pretty evident that one thing that they are absolutely doing in their wake is they are governing in their wake. There were police forces that were um, in all of the cities. There was governance had been returned. In a lot of those places, business as usual had almost come back. You wouldn't realize that there was a war going on. Um, so it's, it's a unique organization, certainly. What will the future hold for them? Um, that's not at, at our level, obviously, to, uh, to, to figure out. But they have been an outstanding partner for us, and I think all indicators of what we've seen from them have been positive. Can I follow on this? Um, yes, sir. I was just in, at the Halifax conference where the, the Turkish Chad came out. I mean, it was probably the third senior Turkish official in, in the couple weeks to come out blasting the SDF as basically equivalent to the PKK, calling them terrorists, calling on the United States to pull back their support, pull back their arms. How does it, how, you, if you were just out there, I know you can't speak to whatever these policy decisions that will be made, but what are, but what do you, what did you hear from the SDF fighters about the mood of when they hear this coming from the Turks on one side and their American backers on the other? And what are the American ad advisors and sisters, whatever you call them, <laughs> your forces, your forces, um, saying about this talk if, that, if they're hearing it, if it's filtering down to them? So I'll, I'll start off and then Pat, I'll ask you to. So, um, when I was out there and we were engaging with the, I've been out there twice now. I went in May initially, uh, and then uh, I was just there recently with Sergeant Major McCauley. And I will tell you, this kind of never came up as a topic of conversation with me because um, the level of partnering and the level of support they were getting by the forces on the ground kept them engaged and they were seeing the successes they were having and they were going, wanting to continue to pursue this enemy. So that level of conversation never came up with me, uh, but I'll let uh, Sergeant Major McCauley talk about it. American troops, too. Yeah, American troops supporting the SDF. Um, uh, what I saw was a cohesive relationship between the two, and they were mutually focused on pursuing and defeating this threat. 
Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely great relationship with the folks that are on the ground. You know, many of them will tell you this is, if not the best, one of the best partners they've ever worked with. Um, very, very good at what they do and then very eager to learn. Um, one of the things I think it's lost a lot of times is that the SDF is more than half of it is made up of Sunnis that are not Kurds. They're actually Arabs that are doing the fighting. I think that kind of gets lost in the translation somewhere um, as, as we look at that force holistically. Um, but but it's, a, it's, it's quite, a, uh, quite a unique and mixed force that's out there on the battlefield right now. I mean, so, are you talking to, you know, the, as the next wave of Americans goes out there, this is, you know, physical territory that Americans have helped, uh, you know, the, the SDF take, and there's already talk at the international level that it may go back, that the Turks may want it back, that when it comes to the peace, this, this, none of this may last. And so, is, I mean, I'm hearing from some troops the sense of, you know, maybe like Iraq or like parts of Afghanistan, we fought for places that, that we, and people, Americans died for them, and we're going to have to give it all back because of some, some geopolitical concerns. So I, I would just comment that, as we've seen since uh, uh, we've, we've been partnering with the SDF, they've been pretty capable not only of defeating the enemy but governing afterwards. So I think there's momentum with this force uh, that they're going to have a seat at the table in whatever final resolution is. Um, and that's not for us to decide here, as was mentioned earlier. We focus on the task at hand as senior enlisted advisors, and that's going out and visiting those troops, uh, finding out the concerns they have, and then bringing it back to our bosses. So I think we can take time for one more question. Hey, John. Hey. Oh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. You finish off. You Just to kind of follow up on that. Then uh, I'll go from, to you, From sir. the Euro you know, European, and, and one of the things, uh, as I was visiting the troops uh, at Inserlik, okay, the, the Turkey ha has been all in on the counter-ISIS. Okay, they have been, uh, you know, despite the political uh, side that you read and you see and you hear, they've been all in on the counter ISIS campaign. Um, and they have been a great ally uh, with protecting our troops that are on the ground uh, in Turkey. And so I, I just wanted to add that, that despite that political rhetoric, they're a wonderful ally and they continue to protect, uh, you know, the, the, the bases that we do have in Turkey. Sir, you have the last question. That's very specific to the Marines. Uh, after Sergeant Major Spadero, as I know him, Senior Drill Instructor Gunnar Sergeant Spadero. Um, <laughs> when, we talk, wow. when, we, when, we, when we talk about... So you actually know him in a <coughs> social a kind of... Okay. Social, social construct. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Let's hope you behave well. Stand up straight. <laughs> very, very specific to... I'll to, tell you when to talk. I see, I see. Very specific to the, the Loki concept of the Commandant's un un Unveiled this past year. I'm curious when we talk about joint forces and, and allies and global integration, when you look at PACOM, are there opportunities starting now or in the near future we're going to see integrating other national forces within the littoral kind of combat sphere that you guys are developing? Oh, no, hey, hey, Todd, that, that, is, that is a phenomenal question because, yes, we are seeing that. I mean, I just returned from Singapore, and even there we have our littoral combat ships based out there right now. So you're seeing where Singapore has is, is invited us in as a valued partner. So that's growing there. We see the Marine Corps right now, if you want to talk there, Sri Lanka, at the beginning of this year, developed a Marine Corps based off our visits. So it was the visits and the conduct of the Marines working with our Sri Lankan partners. Sri Lanka said they, they actually did a reduction and moved their other forces and developed a Marine Corps now to go after specific mission sets that's going to help Sri Lanka, especially along their coastal waters, where, where the Marine Corps is going to operate best of. So they, they've created a Marine Corps. Um, you're seeing developments in Indonesia. You're seeing developments in Malaysia. So with that, you know, I think, though, it's just not the Marine Corps that owns this, though. The, the U.S. Army Pacific, with their Pacific Pathways, is growing this. We have the Navy now, when they're going out doing joint operations with, with other navies, with India, they're operating specifically with. So you're, you're watching this. Is, it's such a growth. It's happening now. It's not something that's, that's for the future. It's something that's happening now, and we're just going to seize because this is how we're going to embolden our partners to also to address the same problem sets of defending their homelands. You know, you got to look at it. Defending the homeland side is not a transdential statement. It's a transferable statement for other partners to defend their homelands. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately we're running out of time. But I think I can speak for this entire group up here. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. But more importantly, we appreciate what you do every day to support the troops and tell the troop story. Christina, whether it's uh, being at Wounded Warrior events with you 
or Tara or Jim being on overseas flights with you and, and out where the troops are at. And, you know, we never get to send you to, you know, garden spots like New Zealand or Australia. We send you to, you know, the Middle East or, uh, or uh, you know, North Korea or, excuse me, South Korea or whatever. But the bottom line is we appreciate you, and that's why we hope this dialogue uh, will be something that's enduring as we move forward. I'll leave you with this. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, a lot of good things that are going on in the operational environment. Uh, but let there be no doubt, we do have challenges. Uh, we have readiness challenges that we have to get after. And as I mentioned earlier, it's because of unstable budgets that we haven't been able to get after this modernization program like Pat McMahon just talked about or maintenance programs and stuff like that. But I go back to what I said earlier and what I said yesterday. Um, we absolutely still can defend our homeland and our way of life. We can meet our alliance uh, commitments, and we absolutely have war fighting competitive advantages in every war fighting domain. Some of those, not as much as we'd like to because of this unstable budget, but the bottom line is our greatest competitive advantage is our enlisted force. And as you go around the world and as we go around the world, we see men and women that are enlisted leaders that have been empowered by commanders or officers to get after the mission. They're applying discipline initiative and agile and adaptive thinking, and they're accomplishing the mission even though they may not have all the people that they should have or all the resources that they should have, but they're taking that risk that's out there. They're mitigating it, but more importantly, they are um, sharing that risk with their higher headquarters, but also they're anticipating that risk mm -hmm. and getting after the mission and, and how to accomplish it. So once again, thank you all. It's truly an honor for all of us to be here, and we hope to do this again soon. Thank you. Thank you.